He's a visual artist. He started as an art student. So what he's trying to do is, uh, you know, work with abstraction. In other words, the characters are there. They're characters. They're in a they're in a story, but they're also shapes and form and line and color. And when he starts making his color films in '64, so those are the two things that I think people forget about when they when they stress too much the angst and alienation part. Well, you're mentioning that he was a you know kind of a purely visual director. We did a tribute just recently to Brian De Palma, who I I, I believe it's safe to say was greatly inspired by Antonioni as well. Uh, and he te- he has a knack for telling stories visually, uh, and and you can you can almost tell watching his films that dialogue scenes are uh, kind of uh, secondary. Yeah, they're kind of a thorn in his side, and when yeah. he's, when he's able to be free of that, you could kind of hear him exhaling a sigh of relief. <laughs> uh, is Antonioni similar to that? I know he wasn't terribly fond of dialogue, with the possible exception of La Notte. Uh, was he similar to that? Yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, if you know a director named Todd Haynes, mm-hmm. oh yeah, the contemporary American filmmaker, he's he's in the direct line of Antonioni, because what what they know how to do is use the entire frame of the film to express emotion. This is what people don't understand. They think when a character is ex- a feeling emotion, or the director wants you, the spectator. To experience an emotion, what you need to do is zoom in for the close-up. Mm. Get that tear going down that cheek, and then that's how you show emotion. What I think Antonioni knew, and what those who have followed him, and there are plenty of directors I could name, Wong Kar Wai, whom I also oh. wrote a book on, says that Antonioni is his greatest favorite, you know, absolute favorite director. What they understand is that you can ex- often express more emotion by pulling the camera back as far as possible, and letting the entire frame speak mm-hmm. emotionally, sort of the way abstract painting works. You, you, you feel an emotion because of the shapes and the colors and the emptiness. It's not because you've zoomed in on somebody crying. Mm-hmm. Well, there's also... What, he's, what, he's, what he was doing, and I think all of the people who have been influenced by him understand that, like Haynes and Wong Kar Wai. Well, he. I, what I've read of him and, and observed in his films is he's he places maximum importance on the environment his characters are placed in. I, actually, the the actors themselves. I, I remember reading an interview with Nicholson about Antonioni, and uh, Nicholson was told by him, "Look, you're not even close to being the most important thing on my mind in, in terms of what I want to focus on in this film." Uh, he he actually referred to actors as cows at one point, I think. But uh, well, I think the cattle line was actually Hitchcock, but it was the same kind of. Yes, he definitely thought the same thing. Um, here, actually, I just happen to have here a little quote that you might like from Antonioni. Absolutely. Um, he said in uh, an interview once that I quote in my book: "Inasmuch as I consider an actor as being only one element in a given scene." I regard him as a tree, a wall, or a cloud. That is, as just one element in the overall scene. Uh-huh. And it's that kind of thinking, I think, that emboldened me to come up with this thesis that, yes, they are real people. Yes, they do have emotional problems. And, and, but it's not about you know, their, their psychological realism and, and, you know, what would a character like this do in this position? You know, the kind of stuff that, you, you, you know, that is the standard textbook about how to write a screenplay. Sure. And he was the absolute opposite of that. And to him, uh, the characters are, are design elements, really. I mean, they're also people, of course. I mean, otherwise we wouldn't watch it if we didn't care about them at some level. Mm-hmm. But he's really working on this abstract level always at the same time. Well, and, and, the, and the environment... Uh, to uh, how the environment reflects the internal kind of struggles of the characters. Uh, Absolutely. I think the best place where you see this, Jamie, is, for example, in a film called Red Desert, yes. 1964, which was his first color film. Um, first of all, the colors are extremely bright and obnoxious in this uh, sort of factory they go through. And then there's a wonderful scene where people are drifting in and out of a fog-like uh, situation, and you see them 
and you don't see them. And the main character, who's played by Monica Vitti, is a mentally unstable woman. Mm -hmm. And you can see how she's trying to hang on to reality and, and not go crazy. Mm -hmm. And he has the perfect visual correlation of this in this misty fog in which the people sort of come into focus and then suddenly you can't see them anymore. You know, and so he's making this comment about the nature of the self and the nature of reality, I think, pure through a purely visual means. And mm -hmm. it's really very powerful. But again, you have to be patient. You have to, you know, let it work on you. Right. Do you view his films as generally optimistic? <laughs> optimistic. <laughs> well, optimistic in the sense that, you know, art uh, can make you optimistic. Um, uh, Roger Ebert once said, I, I, think, uh, I think this is a, a relevant quotation, he once said, uh, no, no good film is boring and all bad films are boring. Uh -huh. <laughs> so that I think uh, if I can sort of like manipulate that quote a little bit, I, I think what I might say about Antonioni is, that it's the beauty of what is unrolling before your eyes that right. makes life meaningful and worthwhile. When, when, you, when you can say to yourself, if I can have an experience like this where I'm so powerfully moved in a way that I don't quite understand, then life must be good after all, even if the characters themselves are in kind of bad shape. Yeah. Right. Um, well, let's talk, let's talk some more about the way he, he shot his films. Um, I, I read an interview with him where he disagreed with the typical American way of shooting movies, where if, if you have a conversation and you use one camera uh, on, on one, ca uh, one, one character and the other on the other, and, and you cut back and forth, he said that was a ridiculous way of shooting movies. And as a result, he rarely used a repetitive shot. Uh, is, is that something that you've noticed? Is that true? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, he was not very much into the Hollywood, uh, I mean, that particular, the technical term that uh, for that shot you're talking about is the shot, reverse shot, mm -hmm. and that is the way that conversations are usually done, the over-the-shoulder shot, absolutely. He did that very, very rarely because uh, that's strictly functional. Right. Uh, in other words, what, what the reason that's being done is to put the accent on the dialogue, the accent on the character emotions, and that isn't what he was mostly interested in. He was mostly interested in, as you were saying, the relationship of the character to the landscape, to the to the surroundings that the character was located in. I'll never forget. There's a beautiful shot in La Notte that stars Jean Moreau, the famous French actress, in which you see this immense building, and it's just the side of a wall that occupies about. 95% of the frame. Mm -hmm. And then down in the lower right-hand corner, you see Jean Moreau, this tiny little figure, and she's just like being overwhelmed by this this architecture. And you know, that's what he's interested in, you know, the kind of the way the entire image speaks, not the dialogue. And, and you're talking about how you get a sense of you're just watching life unfold in his movies. And I'm wondering if that's not a, a, a result of his working style, uh, because I, I, I read that he preferred to arrive to the set on the day relatively unprepared and, and kind of let his mind wander and uh, take time to soak in the atmosphere, and that would dictate to a large extent how the scene would be shot. Uh, they, they, weren't, they weren't necessarily uh, meticulously planned uh, before the day of shooting. Do you think that that probably... Uh, lends itself to that that feeling of life unfolding or, or just happening before your eyes? Um, I, yeah, to some extent. I think he was a little bit more prepared than, than, than that would uh, indicate. But I, I think it's more uh, European aesthetic. Uh, and again, the technical term there is the, sort of the use of dead time. Mm -hmm. Whereas in American film, a lot of people don't realize, but you know, the next time you're watching, like any normal film, any Hollywood film, or just virtually, you know, any film, even foreign films, um, somebody will come to the door. There'll be a an, an, an knock at the door, and then you cut, and the person's suddenly in the middle of the room, and you never notice that. Right. But there's been two or three seconds where the person would normally walk across the room and then arrive at the middle of the room that have been cut out to speed things up, and we're so used to that that we don't even notice it anymore. Well, in there's a certain European aesthetic, especially at the time that Antonioni was making his films and flourishing, which believes that you put in everything. 
Mm -hmm. put in the entire real time. So that's why the films seem to be longer and quote-unquote boring, because they are the exact antithesis of the MTV um, kind of aesthetic, where you cut, 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 cut. Right. Here you, you know, let real life unfold uh, before you, exactly. So I, I think that's more the reason why you, you get that sense of, of real life. And, you know, real life can be boring sometimes. And there's a famous anecdote about how at the end of... Um, La Ventura, which actually, uh, you know, won uh, at uh, at uh, Con, uh, didn't it? at Con, Con Bayola, it was hated by the critics at first, and uh, they were Ooh. screaming, "Cut, cut!" There's this one long hallway scene at the end where uh, you know Monica Vitti is in a, in a in a hotel, and you know it's just held forever and forever. But you've got to look around the the whole frame, you know, and people are screaming, "Cut, cut!" So it must have been a wild riot. <laughs> uh, this uh, his use of uh, the soundtrack as well. He wasn't a big fan of, of of music necessarily to dictate emotion, but he was more involved in the natural sounds. What what kind of effect? How crucial are these sounds to the effect of his films? Yeah, I, I think that's a good question. Uh, I think the sound is very very important. Um, he did experiment with like sort of electronic music in the early trilogy films, so like uh, which is it? Uh, La Notte uh, uses a lot of electronic music and he uses jazz and things like that. This is somewhere. This is something in which his uh, his follower Wong Kar Wai has really gone in in a much much stronger direction. He really uses sound. I mean, he he communicates to his uh, DP, for example, his cinematographer Chris Doyle. Usually Chris Doyle. When he wants a certain effect, he plays a piece of music for him, mm. and that's the visual effect that he wants. At any rate, on getting back to Antonio, Antonioni, <laughs> I think what he's doing, he's very interested in natural sound uh, and the kind of existential, powerful meanings that it can that it can uh, bring across. So the the quintessential scene for me, and this happens in almost every one of his movies, is that there will be a moment where a character will look up and will look at the trees. That are blowing in the wind, and you hear that sound that the leaves make mm -hmm. when they're when the wind is blowing through them, and suddenly, you know, it starts to have this effect on you, this powerful, mysterious effect. And he loved those kind of natural interventions, but he was not above, for example, famously, he uh, painted the grass in one movie because it wasn't green enough. Um, so he was also not like you know a nature photographer. I mean, he wasn't like a documentarian at that point. He was interested in abstract effects. Mm -hmm. Well, we're talking about the things that that the audiences of today find challenging, and certainly uh, another thing that they find challenging has to be ambiguity. They're not uh, accustomed to, <laughs> to 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 finding that very entertaining. But if I anything. Don't mind it. If, if anything, Antonioni's films thrived on, on that, didn't they? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. It's always ambiguity. I'm actually writing a little book on uh, Michael Haneke now, um, the director of Cachet. Mm. And oh, wonderful the, movie. Yeah, yeah and uh, in all of his interviews, he says constantly, I want the meaning to be ambiguous. I want the spectator and the viewer to figure out by him or herself Right. what it means. I don't want to say, here's what the character's thinking right now. Well, a here's lot of us appreciate thinking. that, too, though. I mean, there is a, I think, I do think there's a segment of the population that does appreciate that from the director. Yeah. That, that would be nice to believe. Uh, I know. I, I, sound, I sound so negative when I get on my on my rants, and it sounds like I, I'm, I'm pigeonholing everyone into, into that way of thinking. But that's a good film. To, Cachet is a brilliant film to use for that, though, because it's, you know, it's and I, but you know the the the, the uh, pessimistic in me is thinking you know they're they're thinking of remaking uh, Cachet. Oh no! Well, I think Sidney Pollack uh, or s someone similar is behind a remake of Cachet and the lives of others. And uh, I'm wondering if they're going to toss the whole ambiguity aspect of that for the American version. You know? What would you make an American version of the lives of others? I have no idea. Excuse me, Mr. Brunette. We're getting, we're getting off on a rant. No, I couldn't agree more. This is fascinating to me because, you know, Hanukkah is just finishing a, an English-language remake of Funny Games. Huh. Uh, oh, my. Starring Naomi Watts, so that should be very weird. He's making a shot-by-shot -shot version of his own film. Mm. In English, so it's going to be very strange to see if that survives or not. Right, I agree. Hands. That would be let alone in Sydney Pollack. Yeah. 
Uh, Whitney Pollack, I've, I've been on the stage with him, and I've, I've had Q&As with him. He's a wonderful guy and, and all, but I, uh, I just am wondering about if it's really him uh, who's making this, uh, this remake. Uh, I know he's behind the lives of I'll, others. Uh, I'm not I'll, sure about Cachet, though. Um, yeah, because that is that survives on ambiguity. I mean, totally. I mean, that scene at the end, for example. You know, there's you have to watch that film. I know we're off the subject now, but we you have to watch that film extremely closely. Yes, you do. You see, you see the entire a, a kind of an explanation of the entire film in the very last shot. Mm-hmm. That nobody knows about. But I won't say any more. <laughs> it's a brilliant it. film. Well, watch uh, that last shot. Yes, when the kids are standing in front of the school. Very yes. important. So we've talked about some of the some of the filmmakers that Antonioni has inspired, the the De Palma and the, uh, the uh, David Lynch, and the, you know, there's so many of them. What is his ultimate uh, legacy? Do you think to the world of cinema? I think the the idea just that there's something more than meets the eye, in the sense that you know, uh, drama is fine, character study is fine, plot is fine, but those are kind of, we can do better, you know, as we used to say. Uh, that's kind of the first level. I mean, I'm the first one to admit, you know, when I read a novel, um, you know, there's got to be a plot or else I'm going to be bored after two sentences. But that isn't what you sit around and discuss, mm-hmm. do you? If, unless you're reading a Robert Ludlum book or something like that. But if you're reading James Joyce or Virginia Woolf or some kind of literary novel, or if you're talking about an art film, do you sit around and talk about the plot? Maybe maybe if it's Memento, which uses the plot in a memorable, backwards way, fine. But otherwise, the plot is just like brushing your teeth in the morning. Yeah. It's not something you you have to do, but you don't think about it. You don't talk to your friends about you know the great um, <laughs> tooth brushing that you did that morning. Right. So <laughs> Antonioni, I think, is trying to get at the other stuff, you know, how you use the visual means to to tell a story visually, to give, to probe the nature of the world, the visible world. What what is going on out there? Also, one thing we haven't even mentioned. I think his films are profoundly about the relationship between men and women. Mm. I think he was way, way, way early in. I mean, the first his first three films center on a woman. Uh, his I mean his 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 most famous films totally center on the Monica Vitti character, which is something that never happened back until very, very recently, not back in those days. Uh, Blow Up is about a man, but it's about his relationship to women and and, and, uh, what a cad he is and what a a crud he is. And so that whole relation of uh, men and women, if you look at something like La Ventura and you see the way the Monica Vitti character is treated by the men in these villages, it's horrific. Uh, She's just about raped, you know, so... Uh, and that's something nobody talks about. They just talk about angst and alienation, you know. So that's why well, I try to get. Behind. Correct me if I'm wrong, but it, aren't a lot of them about uh, women primarily trying to uh, change their lives in some way, or change the direction of their lives, or, or assume a new identity, and that, and that's why the passenger was was uh, so unique because it, it took some of those same themes and plot constructions and tailored them around a male character when it was usually a female in his films? That yeah, that. exactly. Uh, absolutely. And I think he himself has said, uh, he has a quote somewhere that said, the reason that he focused on women is that he's really trying to talk about uh, the complexity of human life and our relationship to the world, et cetera, et cetera. And that is best shown through the sensibility of a woman. It's more direct. I think he's selling himself short there a little bit. I think, you know, I think they really are about women. I think he was trying to get in touch with the sort of female side of his nature uh, that we all have. I mean, you know, all of us, um, you know, have both parts, but we just repress one or the other. And I think he really wanted to tap into that. And I think he's very, very sensitive about women. I mean, if, you know, I could quote you individual lines and scenes and things like that, but I, I won't, don't want to bore you, but all the way through, so many of his films, there are constant references to uh, this problematic. Yeah. Well, Mr. Brunette, thank you so much for joining us this evening, and, and you have an open invitation. Please come back and join us any time, because uh, this has been a real treat and an education for us. Yes, it has. Thank you My so much. My pleasure. I really thank you very enjoyed much. talking to you guys, and good luck with the show.
Thank, Thank you. you very much, sir. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye. That's Peter Brunette telling us all about uh, Michelangelo Antonioni, one of the great film artists that we lost uh, last week at the age of uh, 94. Uh, you know, he lived a, he lived a long life. <laughs> yes, he did. Uh, and he uh, accomplished so much in his career and changed so much of the landscape of cinema. Uh, let's start with Ingmar Bergman now an artist whose intense ruminations on faith, death, and the salvation of love inspired other greats like David Lynch, Stanley Kubrick, Robert Altman, and perhaps most implicitly, Woody Allen. Woody Allen, in fact, has cited Bergman as the greatest film artist since the invention of the motion picture camera. Bergman's resume is littered with unforgettable classic films, including Smiles of a Summer Night, The Seventh Seal, Persona, Scenes from a Marriage, Cries and Whispers, Wild Strawberries, and on and on. Three of Bergman's films won the Foreign Language Best Picture Award, including The Virgin Spring, Through a Glass Darkly, and Fanny and Alexander. He received the Academy's Lifetime Achievement Award in 1971. Here to shed some light on the man and his films is Adam Bernstein, the deputy obituary writer of the Washington Post, who just composed a beautifully written tribute to Bergman on the occasion of his passing. Mr. Bernstein, are you there? I sure am. Thanks for Hi. having me. Hi. Thanks so much for being on. I'm sorry we had so much difficulty. With no, you. as I said, it was almost like a Bergman character trying to uh, get in touch with God. It's just there's no answer. <laughs> uh, I, I wanted to lead perhaps with this, uh, with this observation. Last night, I was watching a film called The Dark Past. It happened to be on Turner Classic Movies, mm-hmm. and it's uh, it's uh, it's uh, this this is what passed for the height of psychological sophistication back in the late 40s when when Bergman started making films. It was uh, William Holden playing a, an escaped killer who who happens to wander into the home of Lee J. Cobb, who's playing a a, a, a psychologist a psychiatrist, mm. and who just happens to be writing a review about uh, psychopaths and 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 their uh, mental state. And of course, Lee J. Cobb cures totally cures William Holden in this in this in this film, and that got me thinking about gee, what really does separate Ingmar Bergman from pretty much what. American audiences in, in the mainstream were used to seeing at the time. Mm-hmm. And, and I think this really conveys just why Bergman, who, who, is, who is just, you know, it doesn't resolve situations easily. His characters are tortured and, and haunted by the past and the present, and, they, and they, can't, they can't function with other human beings because they're always putting on, 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 on uh, masks, and they're masking their deep emotions. Mm-hmm. And it's so striking what any Bergman film, regardless if, it, if it's the best of Bergman or, or even not so hot Bergman, uh, just uh, just how good he was compared with uh, with with what most people were watching at the time. Yeah, and I've read a re- I've read a quote from him, or actually a quote from a critic uh, who said that Bergman's most challenging films ask us to examine who and what we are and how we live with others. Do you, do you think that that's an accurate assessment? I, I think that's quite fair. I mean, I can't watch, personally, I can't watch one of his films without taking total stock of my life and, and, and putting myself in, uh, in the situation of his characters. One, one of the best comments I came across, I think, uh, was a review of Scenes from a Marriage uh, when, it, when it first came out. And it was a critic here in, in my newspaper, the Washington Post, who, who, talked, uh, who said it this way. It says, the truth of so much of Bergman's insight is borne out by how often you find yourself reacting or being reacted to as if you were one of the protagonists. Mm -hmm. Time and again, what appear to be avoidable traps from the vantage point of an outside observer of the movie turn out to be inescapable pitfalls of of one's own daily life. Mm. I think that 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 was a a very good observation. You, you, You just can't sit back and let it wash over you. you. You become part of the film and... And they are haunting films. I don't know about you, but but I can't watch one without, uh, uh, you know, fading into a little silence for a while and yeah. you know needing a little alone time. Well, they and and they really. Uh, I read someone else uh, writing about his work, and they said they're almost films that demand that you watch them alone. Uh, yeah. So you you can have a personal relationship with them just 
Uh, just it's been, true. Yeah, yeah, hey, no. guess what's going to happen here? Hey, check it out. You just you're not going to have that kind of an experience in a Bergman film. It's 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 you ruminating on your life. Uh, on what it means to be a human being in modern times, yeah. and uh, what's so interesting is that even though some of many uh, a handful of his films take place in 14th century or you know, many many centuries ago, it, it's so relevant today because of the insights, the psychological insights of his care of, of what he of what he conveys about the people who are the subject of his films, people who can't escape from. Uh, um, uh, th- their own upbringings, um, their limit, their emotional limitations, mm-hmm. uh, and that's what really stands out in a Bergman film. Uh, yeah, and I know you wrote a, uh, of his work in your article. Um, you said he stood for making disturbingly psychological films that explored emotional isolation and spiritual crisis, mm-hmm. often about living in a nuclear age. Bergman spoke a lot about his fear of a nuclear holocaust, mm. and that's real clear in in many of the films, especially in the 50s. Uh, and then, of course, in in uh, you're going to have to help me here. It's it, I can't think of it off the top of my head. I want to say, I know it was made in the late 60s, um, and it was his criticism of w- shame. Yeah, um, shame. That's the one. Yeah. Uh, sort of the uh, all of his movies. A lot of his movies tend to have sort of this apocalyptic feel, shame, and then in the silence, as you may recall. Or as some of the listeners might recall, there's um, there's this, this two sisters are in this bizarre country that's girding for war, and you see them on a train, and there are these tanks going by, and there's always a threat of war going on in this unknown country, and it's very creepy and very, um, um, uh, it, 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 it's very upsetting. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and so you see that in those films, you see it in um, in in his films from the. Uh, from the late 50s, I think uh, I want to say uh, uh, that he spoke about, uh, um, uh, about the Seventh Seal as an analogy for what he saw as the end of man. Uh, so you see it throughout his career. And I don't buy it for a minute when I saw in one interview where he says, well, I, I totally overcame my fear of death, and this was in the early 60s. He talked about it constantly throughout his life and yeah. and, and about dying in a terrible way. Uh, and I know a large a large part of his character and, and his point of view of his films were created by his were a result of his upbringing. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know he, when discussing his parents, he said that they created a world for him to revolt against. Uh, right. What can you tell me about his, his upbringing and his, his parents? Sure. Well, he was born in 1918 in, in Uppsala, Sweden, and, and then raised in Stockholm. His father was a Lutheran minister and became chaplain to the uh, Swedish royal family. He lived. They lived. They were. They were prosperous, but but Bergman was not uh, not allowed really to enjoy much of his life. He his father would would beat him and lock him in dark closets, which he always said he referred to in the film Fanny and Alexander. A lot of people might recall the scene where where for a very minor infraction, the young boy in the film is beaten by his by his by a uh, minister and in, in, in his. And, and he said that was directly from his own life, or at least largely modeled on his early experiences as a child. He said his mother was, as I put it, sort of an unreliable source of comfort because he, she could be very warm with him, and he responded to that, but, but many other times inexplicably cold. And later he spoke about his mother wanting to leave her, the family, but really just staying for the sake of her children, uh, which included Bergman and, and, and uh, a younger brother who... Um, this is kind of important to his film career. One, one, one Christmas, Bergman traded a hundred toy soldiers for a movie projector That's right. that an aunt had given the brother. Mm-hmm. And so this shows you early on just what um, Bergman spoke often about going to the movies as just one of the few times where he had a respite from the from sort of the unhappy household in which he grew up. And even as a young boy, he was putting on uh, puppet shows, uh, which became very elaborate to entertain a younger sister. And he was even putting on very small-scale works by uh, Strindberg, uh, who's uh, best known for these tortured relation- plays about tortured relationships between the sexes, and it caused one editor to go, uh, yeah, happy, happy child, that, that Ingmar. <laughs> um, you know, so you can imagine just what kind of a, a guy he was, even as a, a you know, 10, 11-year-old. And, of course, he, what, what happens is he winds up dropping out of college to go to work in theater and, and probably probably doing it a little deliberately to irritate his parents. Yeah. And uh and then he really makes a name for himself early on with the Sweden with Sweden's World Dramatic Theater before going to work for the Swedish film uh uh studios. 
and he, stayed, he stayed with theater too throughout his life. Uh, it, it wasn't that the the film career took over and he abandoned theater. He right. he, he went back to the stage and directed uh, frequently, yeah. frequently. And a lot of the actors who were big in his films were also uh, well known theater actors in Sweden. Ingrid Thulin, who died not too long ago, was was one of his favorites and, and appeared was a was a far bigger stage actress in in Sweden than she ever was in film, even though she was in several of Bergman's films. Um, as 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 I also pointed out. It was while directing a show uh, in 1976 of, of Strindberg's Dance of Death that Bergman was arrested on charges of income tax evasion. Right. Uh, and then, of course, it was charges that were later dropped. Uh, and just in the last, I want to say, seven or eight years, there was a, there was a showing of, of Bergman's version of, of Strindberg in Brooklyn, I want to say, at one of the Brooklyn theaters. I wasn't there to see it, but uh, perhaps you were and. and, and Maybe uh, I don't know if you recall that at all when that was a big deal in in New York at the time. Hmm. No, uh, did did his work? I know that he suffered. Uh, he fell into a great depression mm-hmm. after he was uh, arrested unjustly for this. Um, did he make movies during that uh, that time before he was vindicated? And 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 are the movies right. uh, much darker or more pessimistic as a result? I can't get much darker and pessimistic than The Serpent's Egg, uh, which is the sort of political horror film, as as I put it, that he made when he went into self-imposed exile in West Germany for a while. This is not my favorite of of his films. I find it just a little too long, too unremitting, even for Bergman, Mm. uh, with very little that I get out of it. It it, it almost becomes like a a fantasy film in a way. Uh, It's about, it has David Carradine, as, as playing a, a circus performer in in the Weimar uh, uh, Germany, uh, who discovers he's an alcoholic, totally, totally beyond reach. Uh, he never redeems himself ever. There's just it's just one more harrowing incident after another, uh, and he discovers this horrible, horrible secret about what they're doing in the country. It's uh, and, and and he saw it as a, again, just a his own view of, 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 of politics, really. Uh, he thought the whole, um, the, 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 the tax case against him was, a politi- was politically trumped up, so one could possibly read it as his response to uh, politicians. Uh, but then, even the same year, he does really just uh, classic Bergman, Autumn Sonata, Sonata mm-hmm. uh, right. with Ingrid Bergman, who's of no relation, and, and Lee Oldman. And that's just sort of the, the, the it's a very, very good, solid, uh, typical Bergman with mother, daughter yelling at each other and talking about how much they hate each other. <laughs> and, um, and uh, you know, it, it's on much more, I don't know, watchable ground to me than, than Serpent's Egg, which is just, just, right. just goes into, to me, I don't know if you have any opinion about Serpent's Egg or if you've seen it, uh, but it's just unrel- unrelenting sadism, frankly. Mm-hmm. Um, so and then he and then his his last really uh, really well known film Fanny and Alexander comes out uh, in eighty two and that took a while to do so so he was working on that as well uh, he continued to work for many many more years still well you're talking about the, his um, his understanding of male female relationships from a, from an early age and like Antonioni who we just uh, discussed with Peter Burnett. Uh, a lot of his main characters throughout his career were women. He he was he was very strong with writing female characters. Mm-hmm. Uh, tell me about his views of of women as opposed to the male characters in the film. You, I was asked this by somebody else as well, and I I never saw him say so much that he felt uh, I don't know somehow women were better vehicles for saying what he wanted to say. He I th- I I am under the very strong impression that he. That that it's just coincidental that women are saying basically what he feels about life. They are the ones who who convey sort of the 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 the, 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 the sensual side of him, mm-hmm. whereas the men tend to be um, uh, you know emotionally remote and 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 cause all kind of uh, emotional havoc that way. Whereas he's he's a very sen- I mean clearly a very sensitive man, and I think. In, in, from what I gleaned from watching many of his films and, and, and reading what I did about him, that that he just felt a closer connection uh, with women, going back to his grandmother and his mother, right. uh, than he does with with men, uh, and, and also a little bit 
he was criticized for being somewhat misogynistic. Uh, I don't, you know, I guess that's sort of a re- revisionist way of looking at him. I, I just think he, he, uh, he, this is how he, he felt more connected to the world by, by, um, by using uh, women as his spokespeople. Mm-hmm. Um, one of my, he was notoriously uh, lax as a husband and father, uh, as you, as you probably know, he fathered, you know, uh, uh, entire school classes of children <laughs> yeah, right. uh, with with lots of his leading ladies who were, I should add, uh, incredibly beautiful. I mean, I, <laughs> yeah. these, are, these are probably what, al- what also is a component of Bergman is that he had the probably the most beautiful women in the world acting in his films. Yeah. And uh, but my favorite anecdote of all that I came across was when Bergman was putting the moves on Lee Ullman initially, and Ullman described it once. Uh, she was sitting on a rock looking out at sea, and Bergman kind of comes up to her and says, I had a dream that we would be painfully connected. <laughs> thought, you know, that's not quite my pickup line, but uh, you know, maybe maybe I should try it. He had a he wound up having a. Uh, Having a, uh, a a long relationship with Ullman, they never married, but they did have a child together. Yeah, and, and it I, seemed to have not have disrupted his working relationships. I don't know what it is, but he he really maintained uh, a very close working relationship with every person he ever slept with. It's amazing. Well, Jerry and I were talking about. Uh, I I guess uh, it was Richard Corliss from Time. I think uh, yeah. did an interview recently with Woody Allen uh, on on Bergman's passing. And it was very surprising that uh, Woody Allen said, you know, people saw Bergman as this tortured, uh, morose guy at all times, and maybe mm-hmm. there was certainly a, a part of him that certainly was exactly like that that's expressed mm-hmm. through his films. But most of the time he was very jovial, and we would just sit around and talk about uh, uh, striking out with women. And, uh, <laughs> you know, and yeah, this is that's what I'd like to do, <laughs> hanging out with Ingmar Bergman at the bar, talking about uh, women. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> How about that? No, no I, I think if you see his films, there's, it's not just gloom and doom. Uh, he did, of course, a, a really, uh, uh, really nice, gentle, with some dark edges. Uh, the, the, the film, uh, 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 help me out here. I'm <laughs> yeah. one's that. I'm sorry. Uh, I beg your pardon. The summer uh, smiles of a summer smiles night. of a summer night. Yeah, I that's beg your the one that. And and then, he, but he's also, but the same sort of. I mean, and he has all these maids who are lu- everybody's lusty in his movies. I mean, he's, like in Fanny and Alexander. I mean, Fanny and Alexander. There's, there's all kind. There, I mean, lust is another big component of his films. Well, that's in Sarah Band as well. I mean, that's the last one that's there too. The but lust. Summer with Monica is one of my early favorites of his, where it's just every, everything is just you know, the, the whole city's becoming uh, is coming alive with spring and right and. and and there, there's a lot of there are a lot of beautiful lighter touches in his films too. The, the shimmering lakes, the um, you know the, the walks in the forest, the, the you know sort of the, 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 the people arranging to have trysts and in sort of a right. you know as they're as they're you know lusting after one another. It, it's really it it isn't just gloom and doom. Um, the I, I saw I think it was Ang Lee, the director, who's also an admirer of his films, who said that. The thing that often doesn't get, and I think Woody Allen made this point as well, is that it, his films are, are real entertainment. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not just meant to make you suffer uh, for a point. It's not like Godard often said he deliberately set out later on to, to make people not want to watch his films, just to make that kind of point. Um, Antonioni is, 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 is known for making people, you know, he's not a, a, a mainstream entertainer. Mm-hmm. Bergman... I, I think, and I think the case could be made that that really came from a storytelling background, where he right. really wanted people to be engaged, not to zone out and and and, and wonder when the movie will be over. <laughs> he said that he wanted you to feel it, uh, feel his films in your heart more than your head. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, uh, people kind of classify him as a as an intellectual filmmaker or, or an academic filmmaker, but but really he he wanted you to feel his films more than anything else. And I, I believe he said that he he finds most of his films ultimately uplifting and positive. You know, like the ending of the Seventh Seal, uh, where where death finally takes him. But he you know he he saved this uh, this family. 
there is a sort of grace note at the end of each, uh, so to speak, at the end of uh, at the end of each film, where where uh, you know, people have come to a realization. I mean, sort of in the, in the traditional Hollywood structure of uh, you know having a resolution, there tend to be more resolutions in his films, uh, one way or another, right. um, than somebody like Antonioni, where it's you're sort of left uh, with a feeling of great emptiness. Um, and uh, you know, in that sense, uh, I, I think you're right. The other dimension also should be noted. Oh, you know, by the way, I should also forget. I shouldn't forget to mention the Magic Flute, which yeah, is oh, that's, yeah, that's incredibly cool. delightful movie. I mean, you were talking about uh, a minute ago because I, I think anybody who wants to see Bergman really should not overlook the Magic Flute. And there's this delightful moment where the camera pans out into the audience, and you see Bergman's daughter just delighting in what's going on on stage, and it's just surprising and and, and lovely uh, piece of filmmaking. Mm. Uh, but also to get back to this point, his films also tend to be uh, uh, violent, on a, uh, strikingly violent as well at times. You know, people mutilating themselves in, in some mm-hmm. of the real dark works. Uh, so, I mean, it, it, what's so fascinating about Bergman is that there's uh, there's a real richness to his work that that isn't there with a lot of other contemporaries. Well, how does he avoid? I know he has a he had his share of critics, and I think that. Pauline Kael was probably the yeah. the leader of that, <laughs> that movement, who who basically believed that his work was uh, you know, pretentious. Uh, I guess it would be the word to use. How how did he examine these serious kind of existential themes and avoid pretension, uh, as you see it? Boy, that's a tough one. I mean, I think you have to assume that you have to find him pretentious. I I don't. I think his re- reputation for being pretentious is 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 over overly stated. Um, I think his films are really ter- beautifully edited, beautifully filmed. They don't linger and linger, and you know you're not looking at your watch saying, "All right, I, I get the idea that you've you've done a lot of set work here." And <laughs> you know, there's a lot of a lot of later art films, if you want to classify them that way, which they, they tend to not have main, large mainstream audiences, uh, tend to kind of revel in how beautiful they look. Mm-hmm. And while I think Bergman's films are stunning. Because of his cinematographers, I mean, you got to mention uh, uh, the, the the two major um, cinematographers who worked with him really to create the, the signature Bergman look: um, Gunnar Fischer and and, and Sven Nyqvist. Yes, I'm pronouncing it right. correctly. My Swedish is not 100. Um, percent I've been afraid to use. You know, <laughs> I, I didn't want to say anything. You know, I, I'm not much better. So. I'd like you to recite the cast list, please. <laughs> There's a good true test. Um, you know, his his films really. Are saved by the storytelling technique, which which really doesn't. Uh, we're men- I was saying before that that he's a real storyteller. He's not going to wait, make you wait and kind of get it. I mean, he, there really is. It's not nearly as hard as his reputation might be, uh-huh. um, in my opinion. And there's always uh, you know heavy drama. There's always a good plot. It's not it's not uh, unresolved uh, uh, making a wait and and and. and you know, tear your hair out because you can't figure out what's going on. Right. Um, I, I don't. I don't find him pretentious, and I, it sort of validates the point in a way to say, well, I think one can find a pretentious, but because I, I, I leave it for there are a lot, there are people who don't like him for whatever reason. They want to see only uh, you know kind of happy, predictable movies. I, I think Bergman's films aren't predictable. Um, you know, you're, you're not always going to be able to tell what happens in the end. Who's mm-hmm. you know, there is a resolution, but it's not always what you might expect. Uh, and so, I, you know, it, it's hard to agree with people who, for me anyway. I mean, a lot of people might find him pretentious or off-putting. Uh, I think he was always very inventive. I mean, you, you see a very traditional school of filmmaking early on, and then he does some very experimental things. Persona, where the film is kind of jumping out of its sprockets and. And and I think in I want to say uh, Passion of Anna, where the characters are, you know, the film just for no reason at all. Uh, uh, I thought that there was something wrong with my with my uh, uh, DVD player when I was watching it because it, it looked. I thought it went right to the actors talk, you know, the section of a DVD where the actors talk about what was really going on behind the scenes. No, it's part of the film where suddenly in the middle of the plot, you'll have the actors. Saying well, uh, relating their own lives to the to the character that they're playing, and then it jumps back to the scene. I mean, it, it's something that you wouldn't have seen right. at the time. And I think a lot of people also overlook the fact that he was trying to break out of traditional filmmaking mold. Well, and I think that his films too are they come from a truthful place, a truthful personal place, and they're 
compassionate. Uh, I, I think that I think that he avoids pretension in that way as well. Mm-hmm. And you're talking about the look of his films, mm-hmm. and C- Cries and Whispers has to be one of the most beautiful films I've ever I've ever seen, just from an aesthetic uh, standpoint. But you, you you look at these these people that he these artists that he has influenced. Well, well, well let's stop you for a sec, so people might, who who haven't seen that film. Let me ask you, what what did you find in Cries and Whispers? Uh, I mean, I remember the, the the blood color of the rooms. Is that what you're talking about, or is that something? Yeah, like that? and and he had he had the the color. The color fade outs as well. Mm, yes, that's right. What, which right, you right. also see in Scorsese's Age of Innocence, and I'm sure that, that you, you see little remnants of, of his work in other people's work here and there. The most obvious is Woody Allen, but right. Uh, and, and, and Woody Allen, both in sort of the comic uh, sense of Midsummer Night Sex Comedy and Love and Death, Love and Death, yeah. Where was that the the, the the, the specter of death comes and, and right. know, does a bunch of one-liners. A <laughs> bunch and of one-liners and stuff. I was, I was reading through the, the synopsis of Wild Strawberries as well uh, right. last night, and uh, I was thinking, that's deconstructing Harry. Yeah, that's, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, a, a man being, being honored, and he's re- reevaluating his right. life in search of meaning on the, w- right. on the way to, to being honored at the ceremony. And, right. Um, what is his legacy ultimately? What Boy, that's that's the, that is the big question. I I, I would say that the, the the point the key point about his life is that at a time when um, very few very few films, except for maybe adaptations of Shakespeare, or other literary classics, were were put out. Very few films were talked about as seriously mm-hmm. as a Bergman film. I've heard a lot of people say that. He's not talked about so much today. I, I think that it's maybe because there aren't as many Bergman festivals. It's not an event anymore when a Bergman film comes out because there are no more Bergman films coming out. Uh, but the, the, the you know it, you have to take the first step and see a Bergman film. I guess the the, the legacy begins with somebody checking it out for the first time. Mm-hmm. And I'd be curious to see if I don't know if if if, if either of you have have any thoughts on where somebody who who may not be so familiar with his work, might take a first step. Netflix. Uh, well, the cr- Criterion, the, the mm. DVD collection. See, that's uh, a know, good place. Is that a- Antonioni thought? is not very well represented on DVD, but Bergman certainly is, thanks to Criterion. But but among the films, if you don't want to spend the you know um, I would lots the, of money, where do you start? With the Seventh Seal or the Virgin Spring is where I would start. Uh-huh. Yeah. Because of the, the – it, it, it's why would you say that? The Seventh Seal, I guess, just because uh, it's of popular culture, mm-hmm. um, and you know that film has, as you know, just we were talking about love and death. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's definitely um, he, Woody Allen, is definitely um, paying homage and sort of spoofing it in many yeah. scenes. But also, that seems to be the one that everyone mentions when everyone mentions Bergman. It is the yeah. famous scene playing <laughs> the death game playing with death. death. Right. Yeah. Speaking I, of which, a, a, a colleague who, who said that when he was in film school said he made a short film called The Seventh Set, where Death, play, death Plays Tennis. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. It is the definitive, uh, the you know. The other thing. one I would start with, though, and I might get in a lot of trouble for this, but the other one I would start for, because it, it's, its influence is all over the place, is Persona. Mm. Mm. Persona is influenced in so many films today. You see its influence from... Fight Club, the Body Double. I mean, you right. see it all over the place. Hmm, that's that's a very good point. That's um, true. I would I, start with that. I heard an essay last night, uh, a commentary on Persona, uh, where they're talking about the Fight Club uh, 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 comparison. Right. Um, before I let you go, because we're we're pretty much out of time, we're going a little right. bit over here. I, I have to ask you about uh, what you do for the Post. You're the deputy obituary writer. Um, and I need need to ask you uh, when you examine these lives, such as Bergman, right? Uh, do you establish some sort of intimacy or responsibility to them to represent their lives fairly? I think you have to. I mean, this is in, in the way I see it is that I have to. Uh, this is the way people will be remembered. I mean, your question about what is his legacy is really always what I'm asking myself as I'm writing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and with Bergman, I mean, I, I like to specialize in film people. It's just my interest, and, and and I find it a lot of fun to have to go back and 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 find out how they were 
depicted in their own time and as well as how they're depicted now because obviously reputations change. You could be seen as just sort of a, you know, a lot of the people who did the film noirs at the time were just sort of B-films. Nobody cared about them that much. But of course, uh, you know, ever since the uh, the French took up the cause, the you know, the film noir genre has become, you know, one of the most uh, interesting and esteemed uh, mm-hmm. types of films. Um, so with somebody like Bergman, uh, you know, it, it, it's, a tar- it's a hard job that requires a lot of time for him. I wrote this years ago. I had to update it a little bit when he died, uh, but I wrote it several years ago because he was always threatening to kill himself. You know, literally. I, mean, right. I, I picked up the paper one day and it says Bergman feels that he has no reason to live anymore, and I said, uh-oh, I better start writing the right. paper. Cause I, um, and, and, and so, you know, there are several reasons why you want to write a story. One is because well, in Neymar Bergman's case is different, but usually it's because somebody is, uh, you know, either in their is 95 years old, or they start feeling, um, uh, you know, a great desire to express how well they're feeling. You know, anytime you have to come out in the news and talk about how well you are, you better. Mm-hmm. That's sort of a signal that you better get the over prepared. Get right. out your pen and um, paper and start. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, so with Bergman, for me, it was a little, it, it was a little easier because I'd seen many of his films. I admired him a lot. This is not always the case. Uh, with Antonioni, I had to write it on deadline, and uh, there were a lot of his films that I that I hadn't seen. And mm. and I and unlike it's it's kind of interesting. The the British, for example, can wait days, if not weeks, before they'll put out their obituary of of, of somebody. It wasn't the case with Antonioni, but I've seen with you know sort of one tier below that with with figures that you know the the, the Post and and New York Times or LA Times will want to do something immediately for the next day because people into, people want it and they need yeah. it. Whereas the Brits tend to wait. Can, they can wait. They'll you know they'll have their guy watch a couple movies. They'll have you know a film scholar sit and do the obituary, which sometimes is bad because the key thing that you want to convey to a, a large readership is is why is he important? And a lot of it gets forget. A lot of that is forgotten about when you have a fan. Mm-hmm. Uh, writing from a perspective of, of, of fandom and and assuming that people are going to want to know and care. Um, for me, I, and, and something I advise anybody writing, well, in general, about anything, but also with, with Obit specifically, I think because you're dealing with legacy, you want to convey really high up, why should people care? Right. So I think that's sort of the key to it all. Mm. Well, it was a beautiful article. Uh, yes, it was, written, and we thank you very much for it. And oh, it's my it's 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 my pleasure. I uh, really delighted to talk to you all. I hope I have the opportunity again, and and uh, and I hope people watch some Bergman. <laughs>